I've written a beautiful book, Faithful to Our Task, and I always call it my beautiful book. It's not just my book. I, I think the um, person who designed the cover did a wonderful job. It has received the seal of approval of the Arkansas World War I Centennial Commemoration Committee. The title is based on the final report of the Greene County Chairman of the Woman's Committee during World War I. After telling what her committee had done, she ended this way, and it gives me a little tear in my, in my uh, throat. I hope that we will have a creditable place in Arkansas history, for we have been faithful to our tasks. And uh, in honesty, I don't know about Greene County, but I know that uh, throughout Arkansas, our women have not received a creditable place in history. So I'm, I'm thankful that I, I was able to do this. I was asked to write a chapter for to Ken the Kaiser, Mike Polson, and Guy Lancaster. And then I kept thinking, this needs to be, I've done so much, all primary research because no one had ever done the research. So uh, I finally talked to Guy and he said, go for it and I'll help you find a publisher. And I appreciate the, the Butler Center. They have published quite a few uh, women's books in the past few years. I want you to know that until recently, the information that I will share today was tucked neatly in the archives in central Arkansas. Most of my work was done at the Arkansas State Archives and I spent most of my time, after I found all of my other uh, materials, then I went page by page through the Arkansas Gazette, as you can tell on a, a microfilm reader, uh, for 18 months. So uh, they kind of adopted me over at the Arkansas State Archives. On April 6, 1917, the United States entered the Great War, which had been raging in Europe for three hard, long years. But the United States was not ready for the war, just as, as Dr. Fisher said. Um, I have difficulty realizing, and I think you will too, how much the government depended on its citizens during this time, and especially the women, because the soldiers didn't have good warm knitted clothing to wear in those cold, cold trenches in Europe, in France. And um, the food supply in Europe had, had been completely depleted. And our allies were on the brink of starvation by the time we entered the war. And they had to depend on the women. Women did the cooking, women did the, the gardening and the canning, and, and they did the knitting and the sewing. In August of 1916, uh, eight months before we entered the war, the U.S. Congress created the Council of National Defense as part of the Military um, Appropriations Act. Most of the members were members of President Wilson's cabinet. In April 1917, as soon as war was declared, the Woman's Committee of the Council of National Defense was created. This is a picture of the Council of Defense for Arkansas. Every, every state had its own Council of Defense. What's wrong with that picture, ladies? <laughs> There's one lady there, and her name was Ida Froenthal. She was actually the liaison between the Council of Defense for Arkansas and the Women's Committee. This is the Women's Committee to the Council of Defense for Arkansas, and I would just call them the Arkansas Women's Committee. These were the movers and shakers. They were the club women, already organized. All of this was new to me. I had no idea what, to, what I would find, so I wasn't just looking for the word women, woman. I was looking for food, children, schools, anything like that. And I found that the, uh, I finally had to realize that, hey Elizabeth, if these women hadn't already been organized, I don't believe all of this work could have been done. They already had their own network throughout 75 counties. In fact, oh let me say first, uh, you see Ida Froenthal with the striped blouse in the middle. 
To her uh, right, which would be your left, in the white blouse is Ann Bruff, the governor's wife, and she was a, a political, I mean a social activist throughout Arkansas. And this is a picture of the General Federation of Women's Clubs National Convention in Hot Springs, Arkansas during the spring of 1918. Arkansas was, seemed to be fairly well um, considered at that time. Did I pass my slide with the 75 counties? I've, okay, <laughs> I got it. Okay, I wanted to, let's go back to the 75 counties. For some reason it's not there, okay. But then there was a, it, this was a pyramid and I can't tell you how shocked I was to find that the federal government seemed to be pulling the strings and the states and the counties were something of the puppets. That was my, that was my reaction to it. I'm sure that this was all needed because uh, we had been against the war and then all of a sudden we were for the war and we were entering the war and there had to be standardization of all this voluntary work, but it went from the national to the states to every county had its own council of defense and its woman's committee. Okay, I do want you to know that although the club women led the way and took the reins in all of this work, women of all classes and races and ages participated. And here's a good example, and I call these, um, there are cards, about 400 cards of this type from Crawford County, uh, Van Buren, Arkansas, that were uh, wonderful examples, and I call them Kareem Abdul-Jabbar shoe boxes. They're two big shoe boxes, not really, but uh, about that size at the Arkansas State Archives. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing that the county gave to the State Archives. I want you to know Julia Wade. She was a 26-year-old African-American wife and mother. She said she had 12 dependents. I'm sure uh, there was extended family there. And she, but she was willing to work in her spare time. This was during a, 19, a 1918 campaign uh, to ask women to sign what they would be willing to do if things continued and, and things got worse. And, and some of them were, were used right away. But this was the card signed by Julia Wade. And she said that she would, of course, she could only work in Crawford County. Now, Estelle Norfleet was different. She was a white 19-year-old working girl. She was already a telephone operator in Van Buren. She said that she could do stenography, but she was also willing to do other things like um, uh, read to soldiers in a hospital or something like that, as well as, as more uh, mundane work. Now, just as Arkansas's women were getting organized, they met for the first time on July 2nd, 1917. A letter had already come down from Washington saying, we need for you to have a campaign to get women to sign up that they are willing to follow the government's guidelines in food conservation. Well, what was this all about? For three years, Richard, if you'll go ahead and find page 21, the gray box. Uh, for three years, America has fought starvation in Bel Belgium. Will you eat less? wheat, meat, fats, and sugar that we may still send food in shiploads. This was, uh, Richard's going to read from an article in the Arkansas Gazette about that time. We are to be called upon to feed the greater part of the world, and that at a time when something like one-fifth of our workers will be called into army camps and into industries that supply war materials, such as munitions and war vessels of all kinds, that the Allies have food enough to last until September only, that a soldier fed in France means one less American soldier sent to France, that Belgian babies are carefully examined to see if they can live without being fed today, while our relief workers feed those who were not fed the day before, and that without a campaign of education to the situation, 
we may continue to waste our crumbs. Surely such compelling words would stir Arkansas's women to sign the food conservation cards. But in those final reports December, dated December 30, 1918, various counties gave some of their um, reason, the reasons that women refused to sign the cards. I don't have enough information, which was probably true because it was a rushed up affair. I'm not interested. I can conserve without signing a card. I'm afraid the government will take the food that I have canned for my family. Now hold on to your seats. I'm afraid my family will be forced to eat cornbread. <laughs> I get more questions about that than anything, but I think we've decided that uh, in various conversations, this was a, a class thing. If you had any means at all, you didn't eat corn, you fed it to your animals. So, so that was pretty cute. On August 16th, Ida Froenthal evaluated the campaign. We're working hard with the Hoover cards. Herbert Hoover was in charge of the food uh, conservation. And he was the one who decided that this would be a voluntary thing. Sometimes they, they ran out of, of a certain item and there was a little rationing, but it wasn't overall like, like we found in World War II. Uh, we're working hard with the Hoover cards, but it is uphill as there seems to be a decided objection to signing anything. And most of the women say that their husbands have cautioned them against putting their names to any sort of paper. There was a lot of distrust of the government throughout Arkansas. There was a lack of communication, lack of education, um, and there was, just as uh, we found about the Germans, there was, there was distrust. Now this next picture is just something that I think all of us need to remember because I didn't, this is, this is my vision from 10th grade world history of the Industrial Revolution. The soot, the dirt, the little orphans in the, but it turns out that it had a lot to do with women's history. For one thing, women started working, the, young, the oldest daughter started working outside the home rather than staying home helping her mom with the other kids because she could do more for the family. Uh, there's no doubt that in seeing, uh, especially President Wilson, change over the, the 18 months that uh, as women stepped up and did all these things and made a, a major contribution to the war, that it had a lot to do with the 19th Amendment passing. Now, I'm not going to say much about this. Uh, but the cantonment city was uh, Little Rock and uh, Little Rock and North Little Rock, but mostly Little Rock, uh, as Camp Pike was built, and it, it, uh, they're celebrating their 100 years this month that it, that, it was, that it opened. But there was a great concern all over the United States about um, venereal disease and prostitution. And the thing about all this is that uh, the women were involved in trying to keep the girls and the boys separate. And the interesting thing to me was that that these were not the the little uh, women who were afraid of this kind of thing. But in that first meeting on July 2nd, the one of the first things that the committee, the women's committee, did was to appoint two women to meet with the governor and a representative of Camp Pike to see what the women could do. And uh, but the big thing, and we're going to skip the part about some of the things that women themselves did, but moving on to the YWCA. The YWCA really was down in the trenches taking care of all the women who were pouring into Little Rock for Red Cross work, probably because of those handsome young men in, the, in those uniforms. The Little Rock YWCA employed eight matrons with police authority who staffed railroad stations 24-7 to protect and guide young women and women with children who were pouring into the military city. This had been, uh, they had actually been employed for about four years, but in 1917, of course, the number of women whom they helped doubled, uh, and more than 15,000 women were able. We're going to talk about wartime employment of women. As it turned out, my book is is about the war, but I found that 
it was looking at the war was like looking through a magnifying glass of women's history so I could see what was going on with women and then I had to go back and do secondary research to find out how to fit in but um, This is the Fort Smith Crossing. There was a, a railroad um, called the Little Rock to Fort Smith Railroad. And this is um, just going through downtown North Little Rock and you go over that first viaduct. Going north, if you look left, that, is, that was the Fort Smith Crossing. Um, nine women were uh, hired because they were <coughs> to, to work in that uh, railroad yard with the men, but 15 men immediately resigned. And they told their supervisor that they were afraid the women would hear bad language. But in my secondary research, I found that really uh, the thing that men had against women working was that women traditionally, uh, for various reasons, had always been paid less uh, since they started working in the 1850s. And men were afraid that if women took these jobs, then women was when the soldiers came back, those uh, salaries would be down. Then, another thing was uh, the telephone operators. This was a shock to me. In September of 1917, I started reading that Arkansas's women uh, telephone operators at Southwestern Bell in Little Rock and Fort Smith had gone on, were going on strike and had gone on strike against Southwestern Bell. And I just couldn't believe that they were doing this uh, during a war, but that was part of it. They they took the, this was their opportunity to speak up for themselves. They could go get a job somewhere else if they wanted to. So that was that kind of thing. Another interesting thing was the the schools and the the school teachers. School women were already in the majority as school teachers by 1917, uh, and I found that they. As such, they were dealing with a failing system in which problems of poverty, illiteracy, uh, malnutrition, lack of clothing to wear to school, and the outside employment of school-aged children during school days were realities. And that's, this was especially true in the South, where uh, 11 to 14 year olds were working 12 to 14 hours a day, either in uh, rice, I mean, uh, cotton factories, or on their own family's farms. And then there was a, let's see if we have that picture. Okay, and then, but on the other hand, nursing came into its own, professional nursing came into its own uh, during the war. It had <coughs> taken a while for people to realize that nurses needed to be professionally trained. In fact, the first nursing school in Arkansas was opened in 1898 in, in Fort Smith. But they made such a contribution to the military and to the war that there's no doubt that, that it, it was a great help to the nursing profession. Secretaries were able to move up to um, the private secretary positions during the war. And one, one of them that was mentioned in the newspaper was the Little Rock Mayor's office promoted a woman to the private secretary position. Another thing that the YWCA did was to, the National YWCA built the hostess house for the wives, mothers, sisters, friends of the soldiers at Camp Pike. Here is a beautiful uh, picture of the inside. It was in blue and amber, isn't that pretty? And it was a place where the, the probably a lot of the women getting off those trains could uh, spend the day uh, they even had cots for them during the day to take a nap and to, to, to rest until their soldiers came off uh, training. But some I considered a holy place because some of those women came to take their soldiers' bodies back home by train. The, um, the Spanish flu epidemic had a major impact and women were able to, to uh, make an impact in Arkansas. 7,000 Arkansans died often because no one was there to, no one was able to get up and get food and water for the family. Whole, whole in the rural areas, whole families were wiped out. But the women were called upon immediately to help, not only with giving food, but uh, 
they, they opened up the kitchens, the home demonstration kitchens, all over the state and, and took food out to these families. In Faulkner County, the Wellness Committee was called on to help in the epidemics at the Student Army Training Corps Barracks in Hendricks College. The county's final report noted, the women of Conway responded nobly, and out of about 400 cases, we only lost two of the boys. I'd like to end my report uh, by just asking everyone to join me in a round of applause for our mothers, our grandmothers and great-grandmothers, and for all they've uh, contributed during the war.